Here we are on one of those days. In fact, we can give the number 273 to this day. And our readings for today are Second Chronicles 24 and 25, our second reading in Ecclesiastes 2, and Matthew 16. Welcome back. I'm so glad you've joined me today. I feel that today's readings will help us to start to see things from God's point of view rather than merely a human point of view. So let's turn to Second Chronicles 24. Yesterday we heard of Ahaziah's one-year reign and then his mother Athaliah's reign. The baby Joash was the only royal descendant of David saved from slaughter. He was raised in the temple by Jehoiada and Jehoshaba. When he reached only seven years old, Jehoiada mounted a dangerous coup which succeeded. Second Chronicles 24 Joash became king of Judah at the age of seven, and he ruled in Jerusalem for forty years. His mother was Zibiah from the city of Be'er Sheba. He did what was pleasing to the Lord as long as Jehoiada the priest was alive. Jehoiada chose two wives for King Joash, and they bore him sons and daughters. After he had been king for a while, Joash decided to have the temple repaired. He ordered the priests and the Levites to go to the cities of Judah and collect from all the people enough money to make the annual repairs on the temple. He told them to act promptly, but the Levites delayed. So he called in Jehoiada, their leader, and demanded, Why haven't you seen to it that the Levites collect from Judah and Jerusalem the tax which Moses, the servant of the Lord, required the people to pay for support of the tent of the Lord's presence? Parentheses. The followers of Athaliah, that corrupt woman, had damaged the temple and had used many of the sacred objects in the worship of Baal. End parentheses. The king ordered the Levites to make a box for contributions and to place it at the temple gate. They sent word throughout Jerusalem and Judah for everyone to bring to the Lord the tax which Moses, God's servant, had first collected in the wilderness. This pleased the people and their leaders, and they brought their tax money and filled the box with it. Every day the Levites would take the box to the royal official who was in charge of it. Whenever it was full, the royal secretary and the high priest's representative would take the money out and return the box to its place, and so they collected a large sum of money. The king and Jehoiada would give the money to those who were in charge of repairing the temple, and they hired stonemasons, carpenters, and metal workers to make the repairs. All of them worked hard, and they restored the temple to its original condition, as solid as ever. When the repairs were finished, the remaining gold and silver was given to the king and Jehoiada, who used it to have bowls and other utensils made for the temple. As long as Jehoiada was alive, sacrifices were offered regularly at the temple. After reaching the very old age of a hundred and thirty, he died. They buried him in the royal tombs in David's city in recognition of the service he had done for the people of Israel, for God and for the temple. But once Jehoiada was dead, the leaders of Judah persuaded King Joash to listen to them instead, and so the people stopped worshipping in the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and began to worship idols and the images of the goddess Asherah. Their guilt for these sins brought the Lord's anger on Judah and Jerusalem. The Lord sent prophets to warn them to return to him, but the people refused to listen. 
Then the Spirit of God took control of Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood where the people could see him and called out, The Lord God asks why you have disobeyed his commands and are bringing disaster on yourselves. You abandoned him, so he has abandoned you. King Joash joined in a conspiracy against Zechariah, and on the king's orders the people stoned Zechariah in the temple court. The king forgot about the loyal service that Zechariah's father Jehoiada had given him, and he had Zechariah killed. As Zechariah was dying, he called out, May the Lord see what you are doing and punish you. When autumn came that year, the Syrian army attacked Judah and Jerusalem, killed all the leaders, and took large amounts of loot back to Damascus. The Syrian army was small, but the Lord let them defeat a much larger Judean army because the people had abandoned him, the Lord God of their ancestors. In this way, King Joash was punished. He was severely wounded, and when the enemy withdrew, two of his officials plotted against him and killed him in his bed to avenge the murder of the son of Jehoiada the priest. He was buried in David's city, but not in the royal tombs. Those who plotted against him were Zabad, the son of an Ammonite woman named Shimeoth, and Jehozabad, the son of a Moabite woman named Shimrith. The commentary on the Book of Kings contains the stories of the sons of Joash, the prophecies spoken against him, and the record of how he rebuilt the temple. His son Amaziah succeeded him as king. Second Chronicles 25 Amaziah became king at the age of twenty-five, and he ruled in Jerusalem for twenty-nine years. His mother was Jehoadine from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing to the Lord, but did it reluctantly. As soon as he was firmly in power, he executed the officials who had murdered his father. He did not, however, execute their children, but followed what the Lord had commanded in the law of Moses— Parents are not to be put to death for crimes committed by their children, and children are not to be put to death for crimes committed by their parents. People are to be put to death only for crimes they themselves have committed. King Amaziah organized all the men of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin into army units, according to the clans they belonged to and placed officers in charge of units of a thousand and units of a hundred. This included all men twenty years of age or older, three hundred thousand in all. They were picked troops, ready for battle, skilled in using spears and shields. In addition, he hired one hundred thousand soldiers from Israel at a cost of about four tons of silver. But a prophet went to the king and said to him, Don't take these Israelite soldiers with you. The Lord is not with these people from the northern kingdom. You may think that they will make you stronger in battle, but it is God who has the power to give you victory or defeat, and he will let your enemies defeat you. Amaziah asked the prophet, But what about all the silver that I have already paid for them? The prophet replied, The Lord can give you back more than that. So Amaziah sent the hired troops away and told them to go home. At this they went home, bitterly angry with the people of Judah. Amaziah summoned up his courage and led his army to Salt Valley. There they fought and killed ten thousand Edomite soldiers and captured another ten thousand. They took the prisoners to the top of the cliff at the city of Selah and threw them off, so that they were killed on the rocks below. Meanwhile, the Israelite soldiers that Amaziah had not allowed to go into battle with him attacked the Judean cities between Samaria and Beth-Horon, 
killed 3,000 men, and captured quantities of loot. When Amaziah returned from defeating the Edomites, he brought their idols back with him, set them up, worshipped them, and burned incense to them. This made the Lord angry, so he sent the prophet Amaziah. The prophet demanded, Why have you worshipped foreign gods that could not even save their own people from your power? Since when, Amaziah interrupted, have we made you advisor to the king? Stop talking or I'll have you killed. The prophet stopped, but not before saying, Now I know that God has decided to destroy you because you have done all this and have ignored my advice. King Amaziah of Judah and his advisers plotted against Israel. He then sent a message to King Jehoash of Israel, who was the son of Jehoahaz and grandson of Jehu, challenging him to fight. Jehoash sent this answer to Amaziah. Once a thorn bush in the Lebanon mountains sent a message to a cedar, Give your daughter in marriage to my son. A wild animal passed by and trampled the bush down. Now, Amaziah, you boast that you have defeated the Edomites, but I advise you to stay at home. Why stir up trouble that will only bring disaster on you and your people? But Amaziah refused to listen. It was God's will for Amaziah to be defeated, because he had worshipped the Edomite idols. So King Jehoash of Israel went into battle against King Amaziah of Judah. They met at Beth Shemesh in Judah. The Judean army was defeated, and the soldiers fled to their homes. Jehoash captured Amaziah and took him to Jerusalem. There he tore down the city wall from Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a distance of two hundred yards. He took back to Samaria as loot all the gold and silver in the temple, the temple equipment guarded by the descendants of Obed-Edom and the palace treasures. He also took hostages with him. King Amaziah of Judah outlived King Jehoash of Israel by fifteen years. All the other things that Amaziah did from the beginning to the end of his reign are recorded in the history of the kings of Judah and Israel. Ever since the time when he rebelled against the Lord, there had been a plot against him in Jerusalem. Finally, he fled to the city of Lachish, But his enemies followed him there and killed him. His body was carried to Jerusalem on a horse, and he was buried in the royal tombs in David's city. And now let's return to Ecclesiastes 2. In yesterday's reading, Solomon sought to find meaning in life through pleasure, folly, wine, and hard work. But both the wise man and the fool share the same fate as far as Solomon could see. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting at verse 12. After all, a king can only do what previous kings have done. So I started thinking about what it meant to be wise or reckless or foolish. Oh, I know, wisdom is better than foolishness, just as light is better than darkness. The wise can see where they are going, and fools cannot. But I also know that the same fate is waiting for us all. I thought to myself, what happens to a fool is going to happen to me too. So what have I gained from being so wise? Nothing, I answered, not a thing. No one remembers the wise, and no one remembers fools. In the days to come, we will all be forgotten. We must all die, wise and foolish alike. 
So life came to mean nothing to me, because everything in it had brought me nothing but trouble. It had all been useless. I had been chasing the wind. Nothing that I had worked for and earned meant a thing to me, because I knew that I would have to leave it to my successor, and he might be wise or he might be foolish. Who knows? Yet he will own everything I have worked for, everything my wisdom has earned for me in this world. It is all useless. So I came to regret that I had worked so hard. You work for something with all your wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then you have to leave it all to someone who hasn't had to work for it. It's useless, and it isn't right. You work and worry your way through life, and what do you have to show for it? As long as you live, everything you do brings you nothing but worry and heartache. Even at night, your mind can't rest. It's all useless. The best thing we can do is eat and drink and enjoy what we've earned. And yet, I realize that even this comes from God. How else could you have anything to eat or enjoy yourself at all? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness to those who please Him. But He makes sinners work, earning and saving, so that what they get can be given to those who please Him. It's all useless. It is like chasing the wind. And now let's turn to Matthew 16. In yesterday's reading, Matthew gave more than one hint that Jesus' work would benefit more than just the Jews. Note that the baskets used in the feeding of the 5,000 were different than the baskets used for the feeding of the 4,000. In the first miracle, the smaller Jewish basket was used, but in the feeding of the 4,000, the larger Gentile basket was used. And this was the same sized basket that was used to lower Paul down from the wall at Damascus. Matthew 16 Some Pharisees and Sadducees who came to Jesus wanted to trap him, so they asked him to perform a miracle for them to show that God approved of him. But Jesus answered, When the sun is setting, you say, We're going to have fine weather because the sky is red. And early in the morning, you say, It's going to rain because the sky is red and dark. You can predict the weather by looking at the sky. So why aren't you able to interpret the signs concerning these times? How evil and godless are the people of this day. You ask me for a miracle. No, the only miracle you will be given is the miracle of Jonah. So he left them and went away. When we disciples were crossing over to the other side of the lake, we forgot to take any bread. Jesus said to us, Take care, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. We started discussing among ourselves. He says this because we didn't bring any bread. Jesus knew what we were saying, so he asked us, Why are you discussing among yourselves about not having any bread? How little you believe in me! Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand men? How many baskets did you fill? And what about the seven loaves for the four thousand men? How many baskets did you fill? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Guard yourselves from the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
Then we understood that he was not warning us to guard ourselves from the yeast used in bread, but from the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus went to the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi, where he asked us, What role do people say that I, the Son of Man, am fulfilling? We answered, Some say the role of John the Baptist, others say Elijah, while others say Jeremia or some other prophet. What about you? What role do you say that I'm fulfilling? Peter, also called Simon, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, Good for you, Simon, son of John, for this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this foundation I will build my church, and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered us not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to say plainly to us, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer much from the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. I will be put to death, but three days later I will be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord. That must never happen to you. Jesus turned around and said to Peter, Get away from me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my way, because these thoughts of yours don't come from God but from a human point of view. Then Jesus said to us, If any of you want to come with me, you must forget yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Will you gain anything if you win the whole world but lose your life? Of course not. There's nothing you can give to regain your life. For I, the Son of Man, will come with my angels in the glory of my Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. I assure you that there are some here who will not die until they have seen me, the victorious Son of Man, coming to rule as King. Please let me start us out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we certainly see today what you said in Isaiah 55. Your thoughts are not like our thoughts, and your ways are different than our ways. As you said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. Without you revealing your amazing ways, there is no way even Solomon could find out all the truth. But because of being united with Christ now and having the Spirit of Jesus, give us eyes to see more of your thoughts and ways. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to see more than the weather report. Help us to understand what you revealed to your disciples in your word and to recognize and correctly interpret the signs of our times. Guard us from human teaching dressed up in religious clothing. And guard us from Satan whispering lies to us. And may we do the thing most counterintuitive of all, 
which is, We'll take up our cross today, counting our earthly life of no value, and we'll follow you, the Son of Man. If it comes to the point of losing our lives for you, it won't be useless, meaningless, or chasing the wind.